Executive Director for the Foundation for Prada Really Research, and I'd like to thank you for your ongoing support. The projects and workshops that will be reported on today were only made possible through the fundraising efforts of our community and supporters. For all of you who have taken one small step or donated to our organization, thank you. Let's just do a quick sound check. If you can hear me, could you please raise your hand? Fantastic. Thank you, Sarah. On today's call, we have Dr. Lauren Schwartz-Ross, clinical psychologist, member of the FCWR Scientific Advisory Board, and chair of the PWS Mental Health Workshop Planning Committee. Lauren volunteered many hours, that is an understatement, to the planning and execution of our very successful mental health workshop held this past March. And she will be providing a summary of the workshop on this webinar. Also on the call is Jessica Pahanowicz, PhD, FPWR is Associate Director of Research. Jessica works closely with our researchers and manages the grant review process. She will be summarizing the seven projects recently selected for funding. With that short introduction, I'd like to give the airwave over to Dr. Short, who will share with us more information regarding the mental health workshop. Hi, Susan, thank you, and everybody else. Um, so I'm Lauren Schwartz-Roth, as Susan mentioned, and I'm a clinical rehabilitation psychologist. I work at the University of Washington in Seattle. And for the last 20 years, I've worked with adults with acquired disabilities and chronic medical conditions. But more importantly, I also have a 15-year-old daughter with prader willi syndrome. And today I'm going to talk to you about the prader willi syndrome Mental Health Research Strategy Workshop. And I have to say at the beginning, I have a major challenge here with trying to summarize two days of pretty intense meetings in about 20 minutes, but here goes. And if you do have further questions, you can always email me after the webinar. So as you all probably know, mental health and behavioral problems are major challenges for individuals with prader willi and their families and their caregivers and their teachers and anybody else who works with them. As an organization, FPWR wanted to light a fire under this important topic of mental health and prader willi syndrome. Our goal was to generate energy and some creative, out-of-the-box thinking about these issues that would hopefully lead to some answers for our children with PWS. And as you know, for FPWR, we feel that answers come best from excellent research. So we decided to put together a mental health research strategy workshop. So earlier this month, 45 top mental health researchers and clinicians from around the world gathered in Bethesda, Maryland, right next to the campus of NIH, to discuss behavior and mental health in prader willi syndrome. Next slide, please. This next slide shows the breakdown of the participants. Slightly more than half were experts or uh, experienced prader willi clinicians and, and or researchers, while the remainder had expertise in mental health research for other neurodevelopmental disorders. Next slide. And this slide highlights the breakdown of area of focus for the participants, including prader willi experts and the outside experts. As you can see, behavioral issues, anxiety, other conditions, clinical psychiatry, and individuals from NIMH and NIH as well. Next slide. The workshop started with an evening reception. And just to kind of orient you to the purpose, the workshop was to develop a focused research strategy to advance the science for mental health issues in prader willi syndrome. Workshop participants identified and prioritized key research questions in this area. And the workshop started with a talk from Elizabeth Dykins, who many of you probably know is a leading researcher in the area of prader willi and mental health challenges. And she talked about her personal experiences and motivation in working and studying people with prader willi syndrome, highlighting the breadth of prader willi symptoms in this area. She also went on to talk about how prader willi is a useful model for studying health and studying the underlying biological conditions may help scientists understand more common mental health disorders. I also spoke that evening. I talked about my daughter, Emma. Next slide, please. Who's 15 years old. And I used some of the struggles that she's experienced to highlight the mental health challenges in prader willi And this is Emma on at probably your left with glasses. And that's her sister, Maddie. Next slide. The 
reception ended with a work in progress poster session by the various uh, participants. And there were uh, all different kinds of topics, including learning challenges, behavioral issues, cognitive retraining, et cetera. You can see all of the abstracts on the FPWR website. You can download them. And if you have any questions after you read the abstracts, I'm happy to answer them individually via email. Next slide. Thank you. I mean, this is good. This is the right slide. <laughs> Uh, the next day, morning, started with a keynote presentation by Tony Holland, who is a leader in the field of mental health issues and Prader-Willi syndrome. And his talk gave an overview of Prader-Willi, emphasizing the behavioral characteristics, such as temper outburst, anxiety, repetitive language and behavior, as well as the susceptibility to mental illness, including differences in psychiatric illness according to genetic subtype. You can read a summary of his uh, talk on the FPWR website as part of the mental health um, summary there. It's in the workshop program, so you can download that. Next slide, please. Some of his key points were about the role of the autonomic nervous system. Dr. Holland is very interested in this area. He's done some pilot studies examining vagal nerve stimulation and found some preliminary results of improvements in behavior in a small sample of adults with Prader-Willi. This area holds great promise for innovative new treatment for behavioral issues in Prader-Willi. He also talked about potentially useful new interventions, such as N-acetylcholine for skin picking and oxytocin for anxiety and behavioral challenges. He also talked about, um, which I thought was very helpful, that psychosis symptoms, although they are quite stressful for families, uh, people with Prader-Willi really generally respond well to medication and frequently return to their previous level of functioning. And again, you can see his overview uh, as part of the program on the FPWR website. Next slide, please. He, uh, Dr. Holland's talk was followed by presentations from experts in related fields of mental health and developmental disability to identify how research in related areas can inform Prader-Willi really mental health research in the future. The first of those talks was done by Tony Simon, who is a professor at the Mind Institute at UC Davis. And he gave a presentation about another genetic syndrome that has high risk of psychosis and schizophrenia called 22Q deletion. And you can learn more about that with the video that I posted on this slide. Next slide. And Dr. Simon talked about how children with 22Q deletion and other disabilities can often be separated into two groups based on their level of anxiety, termed copers and strugglers. Interestingly, he did not find that IQ was a factor in determining whether someone was a coper or a struggler. What he did find and talk about was this concept of allostatic load, which has to do with repeated and chronic stress. And this tends to increase psychiatric risk and make somebody a struggler, so to speak. He is interested in applying his model to Prader-Willi syndrome. He talked about treatment interventions to decrease the allostatic load, primarily by creating a better match between everyday demands and abilities at home, school, and in the community, as well as helping parents set realistic expectations. The goal of his approach is to create a better match, as I mentioned. Again, his talk piqued interest in determining whether this paradigm might apply to Prader-Willi. Next slide. The next talk was by Stephen Porges from the University of North Carolina. He's ex an extremely well-respected psychologist in the field, but a relative newcomer to, to Prader-Willi syndrome. We were thrilled to have him speak and spark his interest in Prader-Willi. He looks like a very nice guy, doesn't he? He was. He was very nice. He's developed something and even wrote a book on polyvagal theory, which is related to autonomic nervous system function and may have implications for understanding behavioral issues in Prader-Willi. Next slide. His theory, the polyvagal theory, focuses on the fight, flight, or freeze behaviors in response to real or imagined threat. And what he termed the vagal break he believes may be disrupted in Prader-Willi syndrome, leading to anxiety, OCD behaviors, and tantrums. He also talked about there are certain things that his research has shown can help normalize the vagal system 
and he gave a few examples of singing, breathing techniques, swinging, rocking, and some specialized listening therapies. If you're interested in this theory, and it is quite fascinating, I encourage you to look at his YouTube. There are several YouTube videos, and I listed one of the good ones that explains uh, the polyvagal theory. Next line. The last talk of the morning was Elizabeth Barry Kravitz from Rush University Medical Center. She's an expert in performing clinical trials to evaluate drugs that improve behavior and cognitive ability in persons with fragile X syndrome. She shared her experience, experiences in this area and developing and measuring outcomes and detailed what has worked and has not worked for their clinical studies. She had a lot of great ideas about how we might successfully adapt and develop effective measures to use in prior early mental health treatment studies. The morning talks energized the workshop attendees and prompted lots of discussion that continued through lunch. Next slide. The afternoon session after lunch was kicked off with a highly engaging and provocative session called Can We Prevent or Mitigate Psychosis in Prader-Willi Syndrome? As many of you probably know, the rate of psychosis is relatively high in Prader-Willi, especially in people who have UPD version. This session was moderated, moderated by Tony Holland, who posed the question to the group, should a medication trial be performed to prevent the onset or recurrence of psychosis in Prader-Willi syndrome. After a very thoughtful and lively discussion, a general consensus was reached that we still need to identify who is most at risk in order to identify who would be appropriate in a prevention trial. Since this would involve possibly giving people medication before they had symptoms, there are some risks there. Also, can we identify and measure a prodromal period that is often seen before the development of psychiatric illness. And further exploring, this is a research priority for SPWR in the near future. And then there was a discussion about piloting different treatments for psychosis, including medications, omega fatty acids, and cognitive interventions, both of which have been shown to be useful in preventing or minimizing relapse of psychosis in people with schizophrenia. Next slide, please. The afternoon on Monday was spent in breakout working groups. And these were really fun and uh, had a lot of uh, interesting discussions go on. All of the workshop attendees participated in two pre-assigned working groups, and they were moderated by leaders in the field. The goal of each group was to identify research strategies to address the specific assigned mental health topic. And the topics were previously identified by researchers and parents to be the most pressing. The working group topics were tantrums, OCD slash anxiety, social challenges, mood disorders, and research infrastructure. Next slide, please. Here's a picture of everybody hard at work. Both uh, you can see the round table there. That's Dr. Eric Hollander leading that group. And some of the uh, the moderators uh, discussing the results later. The moderators of each of the groups synthesized the discussion of the working group to present to the entire workshop, which they did the following day. Next slide. The last day of the workshop, oh, I'm sorry, that's so tiny. Um, didn't look that way on my computer. Anyways, the last day of the workshop started with the oxytocin conundrum. We had a lot of fun coming up with that title. As many of you know, if you've followed some of the research in prader willi and oxytocin, that the results have been mixed. And yet, many researchers and clinicians in prader willi field remain excited and interested in seeing what this hormone can do to help people with prader willi So we asked Sue Carter, a biologist and internationally recognized expert in behavioral neuroendocrinology and oxytocin function, to moderate this session. And it was a lively group discussion. Many people have lots of different ideas about this. Um, and people discussed possible new ways of understanding how the oxytocin and vasopressin systems may be disrupted in prader -Willi. The key issues to address in future research were highlighted. And hopefully you can see those. There was a discussion of examining the long-acting versus immediate forms of oxytocin. There seems to be a different in that, difference in that area. 
and also to uh, research the resultant effects on vasopressin receptors, which is considered a sibling hormone to oxytocin. There is also uh, questions brought up about high or low versus high doses of oxytocin and their effects on behavior. Low doses may improve behavior, it seems, and high doses may actually make behavior worse via their effects on the vasopressin system. Next slide. The next session or the final session was the moderators presenting the summary of the group discussion and the development of a plan. So working group summaries from the previous day were presented by each moderator and the full group discussion followed for review and refinement of key issues. And this couple of hours was spent doing that. Several important research questions were identified and they'll form the basis for key research initiatives for the FPWR for the next year and I'm sure beyond. Next slide. Some of the key issues that came out during the workshop groups and other group discussions included the development of effective mental health outcome measures for treatment studies, the importance of having longitudinal and natural history mental health data for comparison purposes. There was also a lot of interest expressed in applying mindfulness strategies to Prader-Willi syndrome to possibly address temper outbursts and anxiety symptoms. There was a very interesting poster presented on this and uh, this poster as well as the findings were repeatedly mentioned by other workshop uh, attendees in the day's discussions. Workshop attendees expressed a strong interest in further research on oxytocin and vasopressin to test new ideas proposed by Dr. Carter. And there was also a lot of interest expressed in assessing the autonomic nervous system function in Prader-Willi a la the polyvagal theory particularly to see the impact that this may have on temper outbursts and anxiety. Next slide. Another key research priority was to identify and characterize prodromal phase to mental illness, particularly in psychosis for Prader-Willi syndrome. Adapt and test current state-of-the-art cognitive behavioral interventions for OCD, anxiety, and anger outbursts. Zach, when I was doing some research for this meeting to try to figure out who we were going to invite, it amazed me how little has actually been done looking at applying state-of-the-art interventions uh, for people with uh, intellectual disabilities in general, and more specifically, Prader-Willi. So that's uh, a relatively untapped area that could prove fruitful. Also, people were interested in having more studies that advance the neurobiology of underlying mental health and behavioral issues. The global PWS registry was felt to be a critical research to a resource, sorry, to advance mental health research since it will compile data over mental health over the lifespan. The registry will also help in the development of outcome measures for treatment trials. And finally, involving parents, families, and caregivers, both professional and family, at all levels was emphasized by the workshop attendees, given their vast experience, and working with them is critical to advancing knowledge and therapies. There were a few parents at the workshop, and I know research enjoy, researchers enjoyed talking to them and getting their uh, feedback on some of the theories they were proposing. These recommendations will guide the FPWR in developing future mental health research initiatives and funding priorities. As a result of the meeting, I've already seen several collaborations develop, and we have already received inquiries and some grant proposals related to ideas that came out of the workshop. So we're very excited and invigorated to see future developments, new ideas, and collaborations that come out of the workshop. Positive energy there was really amazing. I think everybody left very energized and grateful for the dedication of all the people who are working in this area to help our children who struggle with Prader-Willi syndrome. Next slide. This is the last one, I think. Um, again, apologize if it's tiny. I just want to acknowledge the organizing committee who helped plan and structure the workshop, as well as the FPWR planning committee who also helped plan the workshop. Without them, this was, uh, would not have been, I think, as effective and successful, so I'm grateful to them. And our sponsors, FPWR, FPWR Canada, and then the Prader-Willi Syndrome Association of Colorado. And that's it. Thank you.
Thank you, Lauren. If there were any questions, we're happy to um, take a few minutes to answer any questions you may have. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the GoToWebinar system, you can type in your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. We can then review those questions, and if needed, we can unmute you um, to follow up. So if you have any questions you'd like to address now, we're happy to take them. Otherwise, um, we will be reserving some time at the end of the call to address questions as well. All right. So I think I, we kind of threw that on people. Um, I'm sure that they will have some questions that they'd like to have answered, but we'll just go ahead and save them for the end of the webinar. Uh, with that said, I'd like to hand over the call to uh, Jessica Bohanowicz, our Associate Director of Research. Jessica? Hi there. Um, I just unmuted myself, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Susan, can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. Thank okay. you, Jessica. Perfect. Um, hi, everybody. So um, I, I know I've met many of you at some of the recent um, FCWR conferences. Uh, for those that I haven't met in person, I hope to have an opportunity to do so in the near future. Uh, my name is Jessica Bohanowicz, as Susan said. I work with Teresa Strong, and uh, together we manage the research program arm of FCWR. Um, this is my contact information, so that if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, Teresa, unfortunately, cannot join us today, but this is her information as well. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, give sort of an overview of one of the main um, arms of research in SPWR, which is our uh, grants administration program. And basically, all of our research programs are focused uh, towards our mission of eliminating the challenges of PWS through the advancement of research. And what we're going to focus on today is our general grants program, which are investigator-initiated research proposals. And the goal here is that investigators approach us with uh, their best ideas, and um, those grants go through a rigorous review process uh, with the goal of supporting research that is going to not just advance the understanding of PWS, but also hopefully lead to uh, new therapeutic interventions. And this process, we receive applications from scientists. Uh, they are um, they fall under sort of uh, defined research priorities that we, uh, as a foundation, set. We have two grant cycles per year, and as I mentioned, this is a, a multi-step evaluation process where the applications go through our scientific advisory board. The proposals are reviewed by outside scientists, experts in the field, and we also include parent advocates reviewers in that process as well in order to um, have a parent perspective, family perspective, and input on what is most important and relevant. Um, the things that, some of the other things that Teresa and I work on that we are not going to talk about today are some of our other special research initiatives. We have uh, multiple working groups. As Lauren mentioned, she is uh, chair of our mental health working group. We have uh, multiple other groups as well in therapeutic development, clinical trials, et cetera. Uh, the foundation also invests money in resource development. We identify uh, areas of unmet need, uh, tools that are, are needed by the scientific community, and work to try to invest in developing those tools uh, for, for researchers. We have a preclinical development program as well as a clinical development initiative. Uh, we have a molecular resource center, which is to encourage scientists to share resources amongst one another and to help uh, make those collaborations possible through networking as well as to offset some of the costs of, of sharing those resources. And then um, what we will be speaking about in the coming months is the Global PWS Registry, which is a, a huge project that uh, PWR is undertaking. So focusing on the investigator-initiated grant program, the, uh, the program, as I mentioned, is, is designed to support research that will advance the understanding of PWS as, as well as new therapeutic interventions. And the way that this differs from where researchers get the bulk of their money, which would be larger um, government uh, organizations like the National Institutes of Health, is that we are able to support innovative, early stage, very high risk, high reward research. Um, and one of the goals here is that we are helping researchers um, Begin, the, begin answering a, a complicated question maybe that they, they haven't necessarily embarked on, a new idea that they have, and giving them sort of the, the seed resources to allow them to explore that new question, develop some preliminary data to then take that and go apply for a larger government grant. We 
are working really hard to expand the base of researchers in, in uh, the field of uh, Carter-Willi syndrome. We have a fantastic base of PWS experts, but we also work very hard to draw scientists into the field that may have expertise in relevant areas. And this ties in with what Lauren was mentioning, uh, for example, people like uh, Dr. Tony Holland or Stephen Porges, who have fantastic expertise in areas that are relevant to PWS. Um, we seek them out through the medical literature and then try to entice them to develop projects that are relevant. We, um, as I mentioned, also include an advocate reviewer in this process. And um, we have become um, a very consistent and, um, and sought after source of funding among very, very high level scientists throughout the, uh, throughout the scientific community, not just in the United States, Canada, but um, in other countries as well. So to date, uh, over the past 10 years or so, we have funded approximately 62 investigators over 85 projects and over $4.5 million in funding. And this is, um, the bulk of this has actually been in the past two or three years. Things have just been on a tremendous upswing thanks to the fantastic work and fundraising of our families and communities. Um, all of you on the call, you are, you are the reason why uh, we as a foundation are able to accomplish uh, these, the, the charts that are shown here in front of you. Um, we try to create a very diverse portfolio where we have senior faculty that are well-experienced scientists, well-established in our lab, uh, experts in their field. But we also uh, want to support junior faculty, new scientists, um, because we want to influence the direction of their lab. And so by um, funding new young projects, we're able to bring new scientists into the field and put them on a path where they are dedicated to power really research from the start of their career. Our grants have been administered in over 10 countries, um, in North America, as well as in Europe, Asia, and um, Australia, Ireland, um, even Israel. We don't have any yet in South America. We're hoping that um, in the coming years, some promising research will come out of that area. And um, uh, as I mentioned, we also work to bring in new investigators into the field. Our split right now is approximately 60% of our funded investigators have already previously published in Prader Willi syndrome, and approximately 40% of our funded investigators have some expertise in a related field, uh, neurobiology, obesity, uh, mental health, and um, have been drawn into Prader Willi research through, uh, through our grant program. If you have um, interest in learning more about the rest of these projects, um, other than the seven new that we'll be talking about today, they can all be found on our website uh, through the link below. The funded projects fall into a broad uh, variety of research categories in addition to trying to um, diversify our portfolio by types of researchers. We also work in various different types of research itself. So our research categories vary uh, by the model system that the grants are proposing. A lot of them work uh, approximately a third um, each in in vitro systems, meaning uh, cell culture, test tubes, things like that. Another third in uh, relevant color really animal models. And then a third that are in uh, clinical studies, whether those be um, clinical trials or uh, research projects that are, are using human participants. The research areas also um, are diverse, considering the broad spectrum of the phenotype of Potter willi syndrome and all of the various aspects and body systems that are involved. It is important for us to make sure that we are funding research that is examining all of those various different areas. And so the list there is below, uh, list there is provided, so you can see this includes everything from, from very basic genetics, uh, hyperphagia, uh, mental health, behavior, and cognition, which is a growing area of research, um, neurobiology, endocrinology, um, and uh, drug development. We have been very fortunate to have some fabulous returns of our investments. Yeah, there have been numerous key accomplishments as a result of our grant program. Um, we have been acknowledged in approximately 70 papers in the peer-reviewed medical literature, which um, is phenomenal. 
We um, have also, as I mentioned, due to our funding and uh, seed funding for preliminary projects, we have helped investigators develop the preliminary data, which has allowed them to then seek out an additional $6 million in additional support from institutions like the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we have a researcher that has received a grant um, from the Israeli Science Foundation, um, researchers in, that have received uh, grants from their state-specific government funding agencies. We have brought numerous new scientists into the field of powder really research and, and helped numerous young investigators get established. And uh, the resources that we have helped develop are now being used by dozens of researchers in powder really, uh, powder really research. And so all of these have been um, fantastic returns on our, on our investments. If you are interested in learning more um, about specific outcomes of any particular project, this information can again be found on our website through uh, the link that is provided. And all of the outcomes are linked to the specific project uh, that, that, funded, that was funded um, through the foundation. So in 2015, uh, just in the past three months, already seven publications have come out um, as a result of SPWR funding. So we are well on track uh, to have a very successful year in uh, publications. And um, some of these I will be talking about specifically. Um, we've had uh, two of our most recent uh, grants, uh, Dr. Stuber and Dr. Beret. They are both working in, um, in they're both experts, phenomenal experts in neurobiology, specifically in um, imaging and, and understanding the neuronal network that control um, feeding circuits and appetite. And um, they have both published very high profile uh, publications uh, this year um, in Cell and in the Journal of Global Clinical Investigation. Um, and uh, so these researchers, again, were people that are tremendous experts in the field of neurobiology but that had not been uh, working in specifically on powder really syndrome, but uh, we were able to draw them in through our grant program. And um, they are working on answering questions about the biochemical brain circuitry that underlies hyperphasia using these advanced uh, brain imaging techniques. Just this past month, uh, and this was posted on Facebook because it was a very, very exciting development, uh, Dr. Libel, uh, who is in New York, he, for those of you who were at the conference in New York, he presented um, at that conference and um, was a, a tremendous asset uh, to that. Um, he, um, their group has had a tremendous breakthrough. For those of you that have been following uh, PWS research for, for some time, there was a great uh, interest in developing induced pluripotent cells. And um, what these basically allow researchers to do is to take cells from skin cells from a, a powder really patient and basically reprogram, reset the clock, um, reboot the computer. And then from there, from those IPS cells, they can be differentiated into any other, re-differentiated into any other type of cell. And so this is a way to create neurons. That was the ultimate goal um, because that, it's neurons, especially from the brain, are not something that can be collected uh, from a living patient. But for many, many, many years, uh, there has been tremendous difficulty in seeing these IPS cells and actually differentiating them into a hypothalamic neuron, something that actually could be used in a dish. And this is something that researchers have been struggling with for many years. And Dr. Libel's group uh, recently in February published that they have successfully uh, uh, accomplished that goal. And so this is a tremendous tool that will be valuable for all researchers that are working in um, hypothalamic neurobiology research. Uh, with uh, in, in power really syndrome, it opens up tremendous new avenues um, as a research tool for understanding the neurobiology, but also uh, providing a tool for um, uh, drug development and uh, for screening in, in laboratory dishes. This was very exciting development for us. And then another exciting development was the um, release of the preliminary data from the Essentialis a phase one trial that we have uh, helped to fund. This is the diazoxide controlled release tablet, uh, which again, this was press release was posted to uh, Facebook for those of you that are on our Facebook page. Um, this was the first part of the study and uh, that has been completed. And there are some very exciting results on improvements in body composition, specifically an increase in muscle mass and a decrease in fat 
There are also some subjective observations of decrease in hyperbasia and uh, decrease in aggressive behavior. And it's important to remember, though, that this was only a 10-week study, and so it's very promising that perhaps um, in a longer, longer study, longer follow-up study, the, the results on um, all of these parameters will be even more successful. The second part of the study is going to be completed later on this spring, and uh, we will be providing updates on that as well as uh, other ongoing clinical trials, um, again, on our website, specifically under the clinical trial tab, you can find information on all of the clinical trial opportunities that are available. So moving on to what we have recently funded um, in 2015, we recently funded seven grants totaling a little over $700,000, and this is um, a list of those seven. And I'm going to go through them uh, just in alphabetical order. Um, but this is uh, the, the title, location, all of this information will be provided on the uh, breakout slides. So starting with Dr. Barone, uh, who is in France at the University of Toulouse, um, he is going to be working on an exciting project examining social, emotional, and linguistic skills, specifically in infants in Potter Willie syndrome. Um, researchers have demonstrated that the ability of infants to perceive facial communication is a critical component, um, an indicator of their future language and social and cognitive development. And so we sort of anecdotally see that infants with Prader Willi syndrome seem to pay less attention to external stimulation, and we know that they have delayed social, emotional, and linguistic skills. And so he is going to be examining whether or not these two things are connected in infants with Prader Willi syndrome. He's going to be using a technique called eye tracking to actually quantify how much attention uh, infants with PWS play to communicative faces, meaning uh, a face that's expressing anger versus happiness uh, versus frustration. And um, he's also going to be determining how those infants process language and emotion compared to typical infants. As I mentioned, this will be using a technology called eye tracking, which we're very excited to bring to uh, Prader Willi Research. Nobody uh, that I'm aware of, that we're aware of, has, has done eye tracking in PWS before. And basically, uh, what this does is it tracks, it's a system that tracks where your eyes uh, locate to and fixate on, on a particular image. Um, this image up here on the top right is an a eye tracking heat image. And what you can see there is, is the green to yellow to red um, shows with increasing intensity where um, somebody's eyes focused most when they were looking at that picture. And so this, is, again, will be the technique that will be used with infants. It's a clinical project, which we're very, very excited about. And again, this is exploring social and cognition in infants, um, which is an area of great concern. And so we're excited about the long-term potential contributions that this is not only going to provide a tool for measuring social and cognitive development, but also will uh, lead to the development of adapting rehabilitation methods and developing new interventions so that we can uh, work towards improving social and cognitive development. The second grant that we'll talk about is uh, Dr. Cavalli, who is also in France. And um, he is going to be working uh, on a genetic project uh, looking at the PWS gene SNORD-116. We know that SNORD-116 is critical to Potter Willi syndrome, but we still are very unclear exactly how. And so his group is proposing a hypothesis that it may play a role in the production of ribosomes, which if you recall back to your intro biology way back when, uh, ribosomes are a, a key piece of machinery in the cell that are required for all protein production. So the idea here is that if, if SNORD-116 SNORD is playing a role in ribosome production, then that it, downstream cascade would in turn affect all protein production within the cell. And so he is working to elucidate this, this potential role of SNORD-116 and to specifically determine what other genes or processes uh, may be regulated in the, smell, in the cell by SNORD-116. We're really excited about this because it is hopefully going to answer a, a fundamental question as to whether or not powder Willi syndrome may at its core uh, have be a ribosomal disorder. 
and um, whether it's a yes or a no uh, answer to that question will be useful information for us. And um, he has a very unique expertise in this area of investigation, and, and so it, it, he's, the, he's ideally suited to carry out the study, and again, as somebody new that we're bringing into the field. Um, if it does, if the results do demonstrate that uh, powder release syndrome is uh, somewhat of a ribosomal disorder, this would very much change our understanding of the underlying basis of PWS and would open up entirely new lines of, of research direction. Dr. Lalande at the University of Connecticut will be working on um, turning, turning back on the maternal region of the powder lily genes within, um, he's going to be using specifically induced uh, pluripotent cells, the IPS cells. Um, and the idea here is that all people with Potterbilly syndrome have at least one, potentially two, versions of the gene region on their maternal chromosome, and it's just turned off. And so uh, working, we have multiple projects that are working on tackling this question in, from various different angles of identifying and disrupting this off switch to turn the maternal region back on which would effectively reactivate the entire PWS gene region, um, ideally. So once again, he'll be using IPS uh, cells and uh, specifically looking at a protein, a zinc finger protein, to see if it is part of this on-off switch. And um, what's very neat about his project is that they will be using um, not just two-dimensional cell culture, but using three-dimensional brain organoids. So it's still cell culture, but it's a little bit closer to um, a brain, called sort of a, a mini brain. Um, and so he'll be using that technique. And uh, this is a, a, an exciting breakthrough in science, not just being used for Potter really research, but uh, for all neurobiology research. Um, it's been receiving a lot of press in multiple uh, uh, scientific journals recently. Um, and we're very excited about this because, again, the fundamental idea of reactivating the PWS gene region is very, very attractive. And um, he's an established expert in IPS cells. He's an active member of our community. And, and this really builds upon previously funded uh, research, previously funded research by SPWR and utilizing resources that we have helped to uh, fund and develop. If we can identify a component of the off switch, this would be a very specific and new target for drug development and could lay the groundwork for potential uh, genetic treatment for polyrhythm. One of our new investigators, uh, completely new to powder release syndrome, and a young investigator, uh, a recent, um, recent, recently starting up his lab, is Dr. Potts at uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center. And similar to SMART 116, um, we also still have a lot of questions about the role of module 2 in powder release syndrome. And he will be specifically looking at uh, trying to test whether module 2 contributes to protein trafficking in um, neurons from the hypothalamus, uh, which is the specific region of the brain that is known to be very involved in, in PWS. And so the idea here is that it's not just important to understand what proteins are being expressed and at what levels. It's also important to know whether or not they're getting to the right place. Because just having enough or having too little is only part of the equation. Having enough only works if it's in the right place in the cell if it's in the right area to do its job. And so he will be looking at whether or not module 2 plays a role in the cell's ability and capacity to move proteins that have been produced into the right place on the cell, specifically the, the surface of the cell, to make sure that they're in the right area to do their job. And so he'll be using um, cells as well as mouse models to examine this question. And um, again, we're, this is a, a, new, a new question for us uh, in terms of asking not just how much, but where. Um, and will provide us a much better understanding of the role of module 2 in Potter-Willi syndrome. Uh, he's a young investigator, a, a real rising star with, with tremendous expertise in protein trafficking. So we're very, very fortunate to have him working on this project. And um, he is going to be collaborating with uh, Rachel Weverick, who some of you may be familiar with. She's a member of our scientific advisory board and, and an expert in PWS, specifically in, in the module to mouse model. So this is a fantastic collaboration and could potentially, again, identify some novel pathways for therapy. 
Another project um, from Thomas Gamble at uh, Harvard Medical School. This is one of our first projects exploring the issue of sleep in Potter Willie syndrome. As we all know, um, narcolepsy, daytime sleepiness, even cataplexy, sleep disorders are, are, a, are a huge quality of life issue, specifically in uh, Potter Willie syndrome. And there really is very little understood about the sleep physiology. Dr. Scammell is a, an expert in sleep physiology and is bringing his expertise to uh, Potter Willie syndrome. He is hypothesizing that um, the issues of daytime sleepiness and cataplexy um, may, the underlying cause may be uh, lower levels of oxytocin neurons and erectin signaling contributing to these issues. For those that are not familiar with uh, cataplexy, cataplexy is basically a, a, a spontaneous and sudden temporary loss of muscle function, um, usually in response to um, like laughter or smiling, some highly emotional um, display, and um, is often correlated with narcolepsy. And so he's going to be characterizing the sleep phenotype in mouse models of PWS and determining whether or not some of the sleep issues in Potter-Willi syndrome um, are due to oxytocin neurons. As I mentioned, he is a, an expert in sleep disorders. He was actually named in 2013 Research of the Year by the Narcolepsy Network. And he is using uh, optogenetics and other cutting edge neurobiology techniques. This will hopefully provide tremendous insight into the underlying neurobiology of sleep wake cycles in Potter Willi syndrome, potentially identify a target for therapy or intervention. Um, again, if we understand whether or not oxytocin is playing a role or is not playing a role, whether a yes or a no, that is all tremendously valuable information. It gives us the ability to move forward um, or to cross that off the list. And it also uh, ties in with a number of the other projects that we have evaluating the role of oxytocin in powder Willie syndrome to help inform future clinical studies uh, using uh, oxytocin. Stephen Stam at the University of Kentucky is uh, working on um, understanding the role of another product related gene, uh, SNORD-115. This is another uh, non-coding RNA, which uh, is known to play a role in product related syndrome, but the specific role exactly remains unknown. Um, Dr. Stam is examining the question of whether or not SNORD-115 is a potential master regulator of many of the endocrine issues that we observe in Potter-Willi syndrome. He's going to specifically be looking at uh, growth hormone as a proxy uh, for this initial project, but the results could potentially provide uh, information about multiple other endocrine systems as well. And the basis of this is that SNORD-115 um, regulates the serotonin receptor, which is known to regulate growth hormone release. And so what um, he is going to be doing is manipulating the levels of SNORD-115 to see whether or not it can impact the serotonin receptor function and in turn impact growth hormone levels. The reason why this uh, potentially um, may be a connection is that uh, serotonin, we know that SNORD-115 regulates uh, the serotonin receptor structure, and serotonin receptor um, partners with um, multiple other receptors to function. And so if even if the other receptor is functioning fine, if the serotonin receptor is not functioning, then half of the puzzle is broken, um, and so um, the entire system doesn't work. And so if the serotonin receptor is disrupting growth hormone um, release, it may also be impacting other endocrine systems as well. Um, a lot of this was discussed in a blog post that we recently posted on the SPWR website. Uh, a lot of research breakthroughs we post through the research blog tab on the website, so you can go on there and read more about this, as well as other research, uh, recent uh, breakthroughs in, in scientific research. This will hopefully, this project will hopefully characterize one of the potential roles of, of SNORD-115, as well as the underlying cause of growth hormone deficiency in potter willi syndrome. Um, it, again, is building on previously funded work. Stephen Sam is uh, an expert in non-coding RNAs and is another very active member of the SPWR research uh, community. And this project could potentially provide new avenues for treating growth hormone as well as other hormone deficiencies in PWS, as well as uh, open the door for future research questions 
as to whether or not um, serotonin is, is a master regulator of the multiple endocrine issues that we see in Parload. The last project is uh, with Dr. Jeffrey Zygman, at, again, uh, at the University of Texas uh, Southwestern. Dr. Zygman, for those um, who have been at some of the FTWR meetings, has been a previously funded FTWR researcher and um, is an expert in eating behaviors. He is hopefully going to answer a very fundamental question for us, which is whether or not ghrelin is playing an active role in the PWS phenotype. We know that ghrelin levels are elevated in Potter Valley syndrome, but we don't really know why, we don't know how, and we don't know whether it plays an active role in hyperphagia or if it's just sort of a, a bystander. And so he is going to be generating a new mouse model taking the PWS Nord116 animal model and crossing that with another mouse that is deficient in the ghrelin signaling system. And so what that cross is going to do is going to generate a new animal, a new mouse model that is a um, lacking the ghrelin signaling system um, within the backdrop of a Potter Lily animal model. And so hopefully this new animal model will help us determine exactly if and how ghrelin impacts metabolism, growth, food seeking, uh, behavior, et cetera, in PWS. We're really excited about this grant because it really is going to answer a fundamental question for us as to whether or not ghrelin is an active participant or a spectator in the Potter Lily uh, syndrome phenotype. He's an established expert in ghrelin signaling, uh, again, an active member of our research community, and this is building on some, on some of his previous work as well as previous animal models that we have helped to fund the development of. And um, the long-term contributions are that determining um, ghrelin's role will help, FPW, help, help FPWR decide if ghrelin signaling should remain a research priority for our grant portfolio and um, will help us know whether or not uh, ongoing and future drug development should focus in this area. So I'm going to stop there, Susan, uh, so that we have a couple of minutes for questions. Um, but once again, I want to thank all of you on the call, um, as well as all of uh, the supporters and, and friends and family to whom you reached out um, for all of the support, all of the loss, all of the hard work that you all uh, do to help us fund this, this fantastic portfolio of researchers. Thank you so much, Jessica, for explaining all of these wonderful projects to us. I know I get excited listening to them over and over again. I would love to open up the call to any questions that people may have. So if you have questions, you're welcome to type them in, and we'll uh, ask them to Jessica or Lauren. Alternatively, if you'd like to raise your hand, we can unmute you, and you can answer your question directly. We have a quiet group with us today, I think. I like to take that as uh, a sign that you did a really good job in explaining to everyone um, the wonderful work that we're doing. You know, I would like to reiterate to Lauren, I was at the mental health workshop myself, and it was an amazing, amazing three days of brilliance, really. And one piece um, that really impacted me was the several times from several different researchers, they were stressing the importance of our upcoming registry. Um, there were so many times when they said, you really need a registry, or the registry will answer that. And um, I'm incredibly excited that we, our registry is coming. It will be here soon, and I encourage all of you to enroll as soon as possible, and to encourage all of your contacts to do the same. Yes, absolutely. Susan, I should also add, um, for anybody that may be interested in serving as an advocate reviewer, please reach out to me, contact me, if you would be interested in um, participating in the process of, of evaluating research proposals. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm happy to email with anybody. If Susan, you can give my email out if people have questions that come up later about mental health mm -hmm. uh, workshop or mental health issues. Thank you. So we do have a question that's come in regarding oxytocin. The question is, I've heard several times that oxytocin research is exciting, but it has had mixed results. 
can, can we speak more to what's going on specifically in that area? Um, yeah, and we've only, I think there's only been two published results. There's a couple other studies that are ongoing um, or that have not been published yet. So I think there's, those studies have, um, have yet to come out in terms of what the outcomes are. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people have been scratching their heads about it and yet remain excited, which is an interesting conundrum. Um, and what Dr. Carter presented, again, who she's been, was one of the first people to study oxytocin decades ago to look at the impacts on social behavior. Um, and she proposed that there is um, this dosing issue seems to be, is likely to be very important. And so we really have to get the, the right dose. And some of the studies have used too high of a dose and then have, um, I, I, from my understanding, sort of activated the vasopressin receptors, which actually can increase uh, aggressive behavior. So um, I think people are still trying to explore what specifically is the right dose in this population. And um, there are some... Uh, interesting proposals out there, and I think that there will be some research that will highlight that, uh, hopefully over the next year. I would add, uh, we actually wrote um, a post to the research blog on this topic, I think it was a month or two ago, um, highlighting some of the research that had been published to date, as well as some of the projects that we have funded uh, that are ongoing. So I would definitely encourage um, anybody interested to take a look at that blog post on the research page. Um, one of the projects that, in addition to what Lauren is discussing with regard to dose, another uh, major issue or question seems to be timing as to whether or not it is something that needs to be done very, very early or can rescue behavior um, in, in adolescents or adults. And so those are all questions that are being um, asked by some of the projects that we have currently funded. Uh, I think we will have some study, some results in the next year that will um, allow us to have a better understanding of whether we should go forward or not with right. that kind of research. Mm -hmm. Our next question is, will Dr. Carter consider doing clinical trials? I'm assuming that's uh, in reference to oxytocin and Prader Willi syndrome. Um, I would say I can't speak for her, but I think that she is um, very interested in um, getting involved in Prader Willi research. I will say that we spent a lot of time together at the workshop, so, uh, and we've had a, a variety of emails since then. So I think she 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 uh, has gotten very interested in uh, looking at this area herself. So uh, I do think there, there may be some things coming in uh, with her name on it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's all I can say now. <laughs> and um, this is another question regarding the mental health conference. Were there any actionable items discussed at the workshop that caregivers can apply to prevent mental health issues? To prevent, um, that's a tall order. Uh, I think there were a lot of uh, proposals in terms of what, I mean, that's really what many people were looking at is how can uh, kind of intervention earlier on uh, possibly prevent some of these issues down the road. Um, I really liked what Dr. Tony Simon had to say about the role of anxiety and the role of um, the kind of environment that our kids are in, you know, they um, encounter challenges all day long, generally, when they're out in the world, and how can we create uh, support systems to help them, and how can we have kind of a better match in terms of what their abilities are and the demands we're putting, um, or that are put on, the, on our kids. Um, so I, I think that's one way that he was at least proposing to look at specifically how can we do that in a more systematic way. I think lots of people do that with their kids already in terms of early intervention, but is there more that we can do in that area? Great. Thank you. 
Is there any information that can be shared regarding the rhythm drug? I'm going to leave that to Jessica. Oh, sorry. The, um, everything that regarding the rhythm drug is um, updated on our website. I think that – Susan, can you take me off of presentation mode for a second, please? Sure. Or can I uh, – you, um, you know, I think you need to stop showing your screen. Is that – So I know that we did send out an announcement earlier that Rhythm is looking for patients to enroll in their study. So um, the hopes are that that study will be getting right. started. Right. I believe that year. Rhythm is recruiting in, I'm just, I'm trying to go to the website right now because I, I know that they're recruiting in some sites, but not all. And so I was going to try to find out. But if, um, if, again, if you go to our website and to the clinical trial page, it will give an update on all of the um, all of the clinical trials, and right now, as of this week, Rhythm is recruiting in Florida um, is open, but the other sites are not yet open. And the contact information for the clinical coordinator at Florida is up on the website. I'm just going to cut and paste it to um, to the group uh, if I can. Nope, I can't. That's unfortunate. Jessica, do you want to say where the other trial sites are? Or did you already say um, that? The other to. sites are at Vanderbilt, I believe, and is it Irvine? Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I, it, it, I get all of the trials, keeping them all. I want to make sure I don't provide the wrong information and keeping them all um, It's kind of wonderful that we have so many trials that you're getting them confused. <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem I I couldn't have imagined ten years ago. Uh, so I did share the um, coordinator information. Um, my understanding is this is for study or ages 16 to 65, and you do need to be uh, overweight or obese in order to participate. Okay. If there's any further questions, we're happy to address as many questions as you have. Uh, at this time, I don't see any further in the queue. Um, well, as always, we are accessible to you if you have any questions. I shared Lauren's email address with all of you previously, so if you need to get a hold of her um, or ask her questions, you can send her an email at uh, laurenroth30 at gmail.com, um, or you can, of course, reach Jessica by going to the website. It's been great having all of you join us today. Um, thank you for supporting SPWR. We hope to bring you more wonderful information uh, very soon. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and we'll be in touch. That's the end of the webinar.